Okay, good afternoon everyone. This is James Oldfield here with you. This is a word from the Lord and it's a live radio program. We're coming to you uh, live. If you would like to be a part of the program, our phone numbers are 336-427-9696. That's 427-9696, 427-WMYN or 627-9563, 627-9563. That's W-L-O-E. And uh, this is a Bible program. If you have a Bible question or comment, we would like to uh, entertain those. We have a lesson prepared for you, things we're going to be talking about today, and you're welcome to come in, call in, and discuss those things with us. Or if you have something else that you would like to uh, have a question on, we we do deviate from the uh, uh, from the program, you might say, just to entertain your calls and and your questions. We we are. Um, Christians, we try to follow the Bible, and we hope that you will take advantage of the opportunities that you have to, to study God's Word with us. And so if you want to be a part of the program, again, the numbers are area code 336-427-9696 or 627-9563. Um, today on the program, we're going to be discussing uh, really a, a comment that was made on one of our YouTube uh, videos. This program is, is on YouTube. If you miss part of it, you can go back and you can... You can watch us on the radio and uh, see the program, listen to the program, and uh, study God's Word with us. Friends, we never ask you to take what we're saying at face value. We want you to uh, open your Bibles up, have pen and paper, and discuss with us or check out what we're saying to make sure that it's in accordance with the Bible. In Acts 17, verse 11, that's what they did. The Bereans were more noble. They were called noble because they searched out the Scriptures to see if those things were so, and we want you to do that very thing. But today on the program, we're going to be discussing a comment that a, uh, are using as a springboard that someone made about denominations being backward, and we're just going to be discussing that. And so I, you know, I think that's a pretty good springboard. It reminds me of, of Jeremiah chapter seven, in Jeremiah chapter seven, verse twenty-three. Uh, Jeremiah said, "But." Uh, verse 21, I'm sorry, Jeremiah 7, 21. Thus said the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, put your burnt offerings unto your sacrifices and eat flesh. For I spake not unto your fathers, nor commanded them in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this thing commanded I them, saying, Obey my voice, and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk in all the ways that I have commanded you, and it may be well unto you. But they hearkened not, nor inclined their ear, but walked in the counsels and the imagination of their evil heart, and went backward, and not forward. And so that uh, is what reminded me of what I was reminded of when uh, I received this comment. Here's the comment. It's from uh, Silver Lining, and uh, he, she makes this, um, uh, this comment. Is it just me, or does the Baptist denomination teach literally the opposite of everything that the Bible says? Now, this person is not a member of the Lord's Church. There's someone that's looking for the truth, and they've uh, they've been watching our videos that uh, that you'll find on on YouTube. Just go to YouTube and and uh, search for James Oldfield, a word from the Lord, and you'll find it. And so, the question of saying, is it just me, or is the, the Baptist denomination seem to be opposite of literally everything the Bible says? Well, that's a good that's a good question. That's a good question. And so what we're going to do today on this program is we're going to be going through some things, and what you're going to see, well, is are they right? Uh, what denominations teach, are they right, or are they right backwards? Are they just backwards of everything? And so that's the program today. That's where we're going to start. But... We want to remind you, friends, uh, that this program, Word from the Lord, is brought to you by the Church of Christ. The Church of Christ meets at 250 the Boulevard in Eden, North Carolina. We meet Sundays at 9 a.m. for Bible study and 10 a.m. for worship and Thursday uh, evenings at 7 p.m. for Bible study as well. And if you're looking for a place that's wanting to study the Bible and you're looking for a place that will give you a Bible answer for everything you're saying, then this is the place where you need to be. The Church of Christ or individuals that, that love to study the Bible, they want you to find the truth, they want you to come and study God's Word with it. If you're looking for a club, you're looking for entertainment, you know, you're know, looking for the loud smoke machines, loud music, smoke machines, stuff like that, uh, yeah, you're looking for a club, not the church. But if you're looking for the Lord's Church, 
then you need to assemble with the Church of Christ because we're the people that want to study the Bible. And we hope that you will take advantage of the opportunities you have to uh, to study with us or ask us questions. I know a lot of times there's been times people ask, you know, call up and ask questions and they'll say, well, I can't ask my preacher this. I was ashamed to ask my preacher this or, you know, the preacher doesn't like answering questions, whatever. Well, we're not that way. And so if you're looking for a place where if you want to know the Bible answer, we'll put it up on the screen. We'll put it up, show you where you can see it. And so that's what we're, that's what we're doing. So 250 Boulevard, the Church of Christ in Eden, North Carolina is bringing, is, is uh, um, sponsoring this, this program, A Word from the Lord. And if you'd like to reach me, you can reach me at a word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's a word from the Lord at gmail.com. And my phone number, my cell phone number is 276 340 2653. 276 340 2653 is how you can reach me. Uh, you text, email, call. Be glad to hear from you. Be glad to hear from you. So, back to the program. Are the, are the denominations, this individual said Baptist denomination, but I would say it's not just a Baptist. Are they backwards, or uh, are they? Do they teach literally every uh, opposite everything the Bible says? Well, let's just look at these things. Uh, I say yes, they have it backwards. And and here's what I'm saying, friends. If you stop and you really look at what the Bible is saying, you're going to find that it is often the case that men go directly opposite or backwards in their doctrines from what God says. Um, it is just, it's almost, uh, well, it would be funny if it wasn't so serious, but it's, I mean, you can just almost take it to the bank that if, if a man is saying something, then it's going to be opposite of what the Bible says. Or if the Bible says something, there's going to be someone somewhere that's going to teach something just the opposite of that. And that's what they're going to use for doctrine because men want to, they replace God's teachings with their own doctrines. That's what Jesus said in Matthew uh, Matthew chapter 15 and verse 9, uh, he says, In vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. And if you back up into that, into that text, the context, you'll know that the Pharisees and the scribes were asking Jesus a question about the disciples, his disciples, who they said transgressed the tradition of the elders because they didn't wash their hands before they ate bread. And Jesus said, well, you transgressed the commandment of God with your tradition. So that just opposite of what God said do. God didn't say, well, you need to wash your hands before you eat. God said things like, honor thy father and thy mother, and he that curseth father and mother, let him die to death. But men come along and say, whosoever shall uh, say to his father or his mother, it is a gift by whatsoever thou mightest be profited by me, and honor not his father and mother, he shall be free. So they gave people a pass for disobeying God and obeying their commands. Well, what are we saying? It's just opposite. It's backwards. They have it backwards from what God said. And so Jesus said, you've made the commandment of God in effect by your, uh, by your traditions. And he called them hypocrites and said they draw nigh to God with their uh, lips, with their mouth, but their heart is far from him. Why? Because what they teach is just backwards. It's just the opposite. And so, friends, any time that you're, you're, you're saying, well, I wonder what the Bible teaches on this matter, you can just uh, uh, almost guarantee that it's going to be backwards. Now, for example, this idea, this is, a, this is a teaching that a lot of people believe faith only. Friends, faith only is backwards. I mean, it is just it's so backwards from what the Bible teaches. I want you to listen to uh, what a, a Baptist preacher said, and this is what he made this comment about the number of times faith only is found in the Bible. He actually said that it's found uh, uh, thousands of times, and then he has to come back. I'm going to find the one where he says thousands of times. Uh, if I can't, yeah, here it is. Vast number of verses. This is the first time what he's going to say. Listen to, this is uh, Mr. A.C. Smith, and um, I believe he's from the Bab a Baptist church out in like Ringgold or somewhere near Dallas. I then want to note the vast and overwhelming number of verses that salvation by faith only, vast and overwhelming number of verses, vast and overwhelming number of verses, vast and overwhelming number of verses that teach salvation by faith only, 
vast and overwhelming number of verses that teach faith only. Now, he says vast and overwhelming number of verses that teach faith only. Well, friends, when you start looking at the number, the vast number of verses that teach faith only, you won't find vast numbers. You'll actually just find one verse that says faith only, and it says not by faith only. So this is what he comes back, he, this is what he says about, uh, about his, he gives an explanation about why he said that, and this is what he said, this is the next time he comes back, this is what he has to say. And so my question, we have thousands of verses that promise salvation based upon grace through faith only, are we going to ignore all of those verses and interpret them in light of uh, this and a couple of other um, uh, passages that relate to baptism, a couple. Of okay, that's not the one he said. That's he, he. That's another one where he says thousands of verses. Now, now here's his explanation. Well, this is my problem with the Church of Christ plan of salvation. It's not found at any one point in Scripture. Salvation, I believe, and I believe the Scriptures do clearly teach this. Salvation comes to us at the point of faith. Now, I know previously when I was on a statement of hyperbole where I mentioned that faith only was found thousands of times in the Bible, literally it's not found like that. But let me explain. They're not literally thousands of verses that say, quote, faith only, unquote. But nonetheless, I do believe that we find scores of verses where it says, quote, faith, unquote, and there's nothing else. In other words, if we look at John 3.16, we don't find anything about baptism there. When I introduce my wife, I don't say this is my only wife, Lori. I simply say this is my wife. Same thing is true when I introduce my mother. I don't say this is my only mother. It's assumed. And so when we find multiple verses throughout the scriptures that say simply faith, then certainly the clear indication is that those are salvation by faith verses and faith only. Do we have to add something else into it? Well, let's say that I hired someone to... Now, now listen, do you hear what his explanation was? Well, it's implied. No, friend, it's not implied faith only. Just because it says you're saved by faith, that doesn't imply only and nothing else. See, friends, this is why this is backwards. When someone says you're saved by faith, I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, Ephesians 2, verse 8, that's the verse that everybody goes to. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is the gift of God. But it doesn't say faith only. And to say that it means faith only, just because you introduce your wife or your mother and everybody says, oh, that must be your only mother. Well, that's, that's a given because everybody only has one mother. And... You might introduce your wife and say, this is my wife, but there's a lot of people running around with several wives. So I don't know that that's really a good argument. I know you only have one mother. You know, you, you only come into the world through one one person, and that, that is your mother. Now, you might say, well, I have a birth mother, I have an adopted mother, and I have a, you know, a godmother or a grandmother or some other kind of mother, but uh, it's, it's, it is not the same as saying faith only. Here's why. The Bible teaches that you're saved by faith, but not only. James 2, verse 24, See then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. Friends, if you want to talk about vast number of verses, now he went from, if you remember Mr. Smith, he went from uh, a vast number of verses to thousands of verses to uh, a, uh, I can't remember the, the last term that he used there, it wasn't uh, uh, scores, it was scores of verses, but he, he never gave any of them that said faith only. Now, he can give you verses that say faith, but not faith only. But here's the thing. When you add only, or when you say, even when you say it's implied only, you negate everything that the Bible says you're, that is also connected to your salvation. In uh, 1 Timothy 4, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse uh, 10, listen to what Paul says. 1 Timothy 4 and verse 10, he says, For therefore we both uh, labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. 
God is the Savior of all men. Now, does that mean you're saved by faith only, even without God? No. God's in there somewhere. Now, I know we've done lessons on this before. <clears throat> I think the, the Salvation Chain is, is up on YouTube. You can watch that and listen to it. But there's a lot of things that are connected to salvation that show that it's not faith only. You're saved by God's love. You're saved by God's grace. The grace that bringeth salvation uh, hath appeared to all men. Uh, Titus 2 and verse 11. Uh, as a matter of fact, if you stay in Ephesians chapter 2, uh, Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 8, the verse we just read, verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So here's the, the grace uh, God's grace is extended. We should walk in God's grace. We should walk in these in these good works. So there's something that we do. It's not faith only. There's, there's works involved. Now, um, so you talk about faith only, you take away Christ. I mean, Christ came to save the world, but yet someone who says faith only is telling us, well, Christ's not important. Now, anybody, does anybody want to affirm that? Does anybody want to say, well, that's right, James, you know, Christ is not important because it's faith saved by faith only. Well, what do you have faith in if Christ is not part of the plan? If Christ didn't come to die for our sins? And when someone says things like, well, the, the problem with the Church of Christ is they, you can't find their plan of salvation in one verse. You can't find the Baptist plan of salvation in one verse. Listen, friends, let me show you how, how simple this is. And I'm, I'm simply showing you that if we just open our Bibles up, let's use a little common sense, you know, let's use our heads for something besides a hat rack, all right, let's, uh, let's look at the Bible and let's just use our common sense that, that God gave us, or exercise it. You know, I know some people's reasoning ability. Uh, Paul said that your, your senses have to be exercised in, in Hebrews 5 verse 12, but we got a lot of couch potatoes when it comes to our religion, when it comes to the Bible. But I want you to consider that if faith only, if you're saved at the point of faith, and that's what Mr. Smith said, you say at the point of faith, then you have problems when you come to places like John 12, uh, John 12, verse 42. The Bible says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him. Now, if we stop there, Mr. Smith would have to say, yeah, well, they're saved. The Baptist idea, or the, the, the denominational idea, it's not just the Baptist, but the denominational idea of saved by faith only would have these people saved. Because there it is, saved by they were they believed, saved the point of faith. But because the Pharisees, the verse says, but because the Pharisees did not confess him, lest they be, lest they should be put out of synagogue, for they loved the praise of God more than the praise of uh, more than praise of men, more than the praise of God. They loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. I get it right. Now, can someone love the praise of men more than the praise of God, and be saved? Can someone? be saved at the point of belief but not confess Christ? See, friends, you have all kinds of problems. You have all kinds of problems when you say faith only. It's backwards. It's just backward to what God says. God never said, saved by faith only. God said, saved by faith. God says you have to have faith to be saved. But James tells us to receive the engrafted word which is able to save your souls, James 1.21. And that the gospel is the power of God and the salvation, Romans 1 and verse 16. Paul says the preaching of the gospel is what saves in 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. Now, are we still saying that there's faith only? See, it's just backwards. And when I say backwards, I mean it's, it's going in the other direction. Faith only says there's only one thing that's essential to salvation. And the Bible says, no, there are multiple things that are connected to your salvation that are required that are, that are connected, that are involved in your salvation, and if you limit those or take all those away, or any one of those away, then you don't have salvation. So it's just backwards, and that's, that's what I'm saying, friends. Obedience to the gospel is what saves. In Hebrews, Hebrews 5, verses 8 and 9, the Bible says that he became the author of salvation to all them who will obey him. So if you're obedient to Christ you're going to do more than just have faith in him. You're going to do the things that he says to do. Now, I, don't, I just don't see how someone can say, well, I'm, I agree by, you know, say by faith only. That's what I'm saying. It's just backwards. It's just the opposite. 
of, of what God said. And again, we go back to what Jeremiah said, or God said about his people. I gave them the commandments. I told them this is what you should walk in. And they wouldn't do it, and they went backward and not forward. Friends, have you ever just stopped to think, and I'm just asking you, stop and consider, is what you've been taught all your life, church you're in, most people have probably been in the same church all their life, but friends, if you're listening to the sound of my voice, I really want you to stop and just honestly think, honestly answer this question. Could it be that what you've been taught is wrong? Could it be that what you've been taught is actually going backwards, away from God, and not toward Him? Now, the reason I say going going backwards, away from God, listen to what listen to what Paul will say. If you if you do something, or if you're uh, obeying something that's contrary to the gospel, you're actually being moved away because what you're being taught is another gospel. In other words, if it's not lined up with the Bible, it's another gospel. And Paul says when you hear another gospel, it moves you away. You actually go backwards. You don't get close to Christ, you move farther away from him. How do I know that? Well, listen, in Galatians 1, verse 6, now listen carefully. Galatians 1 verse 6, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now you have removed, you're removed from him that called you. Now when you remove something, friends, you take it away. And he says you removed from, uh, from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another. But there be some that would trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now, friends, if you hear something different than what the Bible is saying, it's moving you away from Christ. It's moving you away from the grace of Christ. It's moving you away from God. You're going backwards, not forward. I didn't write the book. I'm just telling you what it says. See that? Saved by faith only is it's backwards. It's backwards. And, and right along on the heels of that is this idea of born in sin. Now, friends, here's a doctrine that's just backwards. I mean, it is it is it's so twisted backwards. I, it, I mean, I don't know. I, this is one doctrine that I can't get, and I but I've talked to a number of individuals that are in denominations, Baptist church and, and even Baptist preachers, that said this is one thing that they they, they, don't, they don't agree with. You can't agree. I don't think if you're if you're honest, no minded, you just can't agree that born in sin is right. I know that I've, I've had. Discussion with people on the phone. There's a, there's a fellow from Tennessee that called me a while back, and we went round and round on this. And he was, you know, I caught him, tripped him up. He's saying you're born in sin. Uh, you don't have choice. But then he says you have you have a, a, a choice to choose, or you have the ability to choose. Well, if you have the ability to choose, then you must not have been born in sin. I mean, if you're born in sin, you didn't get the choice. Somewhere down the line, you you didn't get to choose. So, so which is it? Do you have the ability to choose if you're going to sin or not? Or, or are you born in sin? Which is it? And so this born in sin is just backwards. Man says, man says, well, you do nothing and you're sinful. And you do nothing to be saved. Now, this is just opposite of what the Bible says. The Bible says that you come into this world sinless. That you have to do something in order to sin. And then that you have to do something to get out of it. Man says you do nothing to get into it and you do nothing to get out of it. Now, watch this. Let's just notice what the Bible has to say about born in sin. Just I'm going to show you how, how backwards it really is, friends. And I believe if you're, uh, if you're listening, if you're writing these things down, writing these verses down, I would really uh, commend you for that. But listen to what the Bible has to say. In in Matthew, in Matthew chapter uh, 18, listen to what the Bible has to say. In Matthew chapter 18, and friends, I'm just saying, just let's just use a little, let's use a little noggin, you know, let's exercise the brain, get the, get the squirrel running up there, get the wheels turning. In Matthew 18, beginning in verse 1, and the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, 
except ye be converted and become as little children, ye sh you shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Now, why would Jesus say, become as little children in order to enter the kingdom of heaven, if little children are born in sin? Now, according to the doctrine that many people in the denominational world believe, the Calvinist doctrine, that, you're, that you inherit sin, and I have, I have in front of me the, you know, a number of the uh, manuals and catechisms and things like that. The Methodist Discipline, for example, says, uh, Original sin standeth not in the following of Adam, but it is the corruption of the nature of every man, which naturally is engendered of the offspring of Adam. Now that's the Methodist, that's the Methodist Discipline. Uh, the Church of God in Christ says, uh, sin is uh, called the original sin. Adam's sin committed by eating the forbidden fruit and from the tree of knowledge of good and evil carried with it a permanent pollution. A permanent pollution. And depraved human nature to all his descendants. Now friends, if something's permanent, I mean, it, it can't be removed. So even when the blood of Christ comes along, see, if it's permanent, you, you still got it. This is what I'm saying. Born in sin, it, it it's backwards. It actually says it actually makes the blood of Christ uh, of less effect. It takes away the power of the blood. You know, there's power in the blood, power in the blood, and that's what everybody sings. But yet, someone who believes born in sin, you know, would have to say, well, not that much power in the blood. It won't take away Adam's sin. It won't take away that permanent mark of of Adam's sin. So. I'm just showing, friends. These are these are what these are things that that you all believe. What your religious neighbor believes, and it's backward from what God says. Now, so Jesus called this little child in the midst of them and said, um, uh, "Become as a little child." Now, why would he become like that little child? Why would he want you to become like that little child who's born in sin, sinful nature? I mean, they're arguing about the disciples were arguing about who was going to be the greatest in the kingdom. And Jesus says, "Well, you got to quit fussing and fighting. You got to you got to become like a little child that's guilty of sin." Well, don't you think fussing and fighting, trying to see who's best, you know, competing, wanting wanting to be the best, wanting to be on the right hand, who's the greatest? That's that's uh, sinful. Sounds like they already got it down, you know. Become as a little child. Oh Lord, we have that down. We're fighting like little children. Who's the best? That's not what Jesus is talking about. Jesus says you have to become as a little child. That is, you should you should uh, uh, be like them in the sense of their innocence. Now, someone might say, "Well, uh, James, Psalm fifty-one, verse five. Psalm fifty-one, verse five. David said, "I was shaped in sin, and in sin did my mother conceive me." Friends, do you realize that Psalm fifty-one, five? Is David talking about the circumstance in which he was brought into the world? He was conceived in sin, not from his direct mother, but from his grandmother. If you go back, you go back to Genesis chapter 38, and I'm, I really don't want to take the time to read this. I will if someone calls in and wants to go through it. But in Genesis 38, you find the sin of Judah with Tamar. Judah went in to Tamar who was his daughter-in-law, he was supposed to give his son to Tamar to raise up a child to his dead brother, and he didn't do it. And so Tamar dressed up like a harlot, and Judah went into her. So here he is, he, he's, you know, he, he has a very, every intent, I'm going to fornicate with this harlot. He didn't know that it was his daughter-in-law. She found out that she was with child, they said, we're going to kill her. And she says, well, you know these things, the, these the staff and this this ring. This these are the uh, belong to the man who's the father, and it was Judah. But because of that sin, for ten generations, for ten generations, there was a the curse of sin was upon David, and in, Je in Deuteronomy twenty three, Deuteronomy uh, twenty three, and verse. Two, 
The Bible says, A bastard shall not enter into the congregation of the Lord. Even to his tenth generation shall he not enter into the congregation of the Lord. So for ten generations, so for ten generations, David's uh, ancestors couldn't go into the congregation of the Lord. That, that was a sin. Now you want to talk about inheriting a sin? That was a curse that was, that, that was inherited upon them. Not because of their nature, but it was, it was the consequence of a sin. But listen to Psalm 122. Psalm 122 and verse 1. David said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. You know why? Because David was the 10th generation. And so the law said, for 10 generations you can't go in. David said, well, I'm glad that I can go now. The, the, the curse was lifted off. See, it was removed. The consequence of that sin was, was removed. And so that's why David said that. It had nothing to do with it had nothing to do with uh, uh, inheriting something from Adam. He said, in, in sin did my mother conceive me. Why didn't he say in sin, Adam, uh, my mother conceived me in Adam's sin or something? Why didn't he say that? You know why? Because he, he had no sin. Friends, to say that a child has sin really indicts God when you get right down to it. God doesn't have the power to remove sin, and so every child that comes to the world is sinful. I just don't understand that at all. And I wish someone would explain it to me. So I'm going through these things, friends, showing you here's some ways that, that men's doctrines are just backwards. I mean, they are just backward from what the Bible says. Now, if you want to talk about it, you want to be a part of the program, and you have some questions or comments that you want to add to that discussion, I'd be, I'd be glad to uh, uh, entertain it. But I want you to, and I want to, I want to hear from you. Uh, 336 is the area code 427-9696 427-WMYN or 627-9563 that's 627-WLOE and be a part of the program so now let's 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 move on maybe uh, I'll tell you what let's give a little bit more on this born and sin because I know it's something that uh, a lot of people are, are hung up on uh, Psalm 58 Psalm 58 is another sugar stick if you will another verse that people like to quote that uh, that believe or profess born in sin. But again, friends, if you just use a little common sense, uh, it, it goes a long way. Psalm 58, verse 3, The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born, speaking lies. Uh, friends, have you ever thought about the fact that you can't, you can't leave? until you got there. You, know, you can't go away unless you arrive. You can't be lost. Uh, you know, you can't be you can't be found unless you're lost. Um, you, you have to you have to leave in order to go astray. So if the Bible says they go astray as soon as they be born, you're not born in sin. I mean, there. You know, we. You have to at least to say, well, there's there's a little bit of time frame there. I don't know. You know, you want to might say it's an hour or two hours, whatever. But then you're not born in sin. And I'm saying, friends, you're not born in sin. Even as you grow older, as a child grows older, they're not in sin. This is a an illustration, exaggeration, hyperbole, if you will, of what David is uh, what David is talking about. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they be born speaking lies. I've never heard a child speak lies. I've never heard a baby talk from the womb. Now someone says, well, all that jib jab and all that crying that babies do, that's all lies. Really? Really, friends? I mean, that's, that's, that's your argument? That, that children lie when they're crying? What are they lying about? Oh, I don't, I'm, I'm not really dirty. I don't really have a dirty diaper. I'm just, I'm just lying. I'm just crying because I'm, I'm lying, telling you a lie. You know, I'm hungry, I'm hungry, so I'm crying. No, not really, not really, I'm just lying. Friends, let's, let's be serious here. This idea that children are born in sin and they go astray as soon as they're born is backwards from the Bible. Now, you, you, have, you, have, to, um, uh, I, you have to work at it to make the Bible teach that. You have to make the, you have to make what the Bible teach that. If they're born... 
they're safe. See, if if they uh, if they are never born, are they saved? Let me ask you that. If they're never born, are they saved? They go, they go astray as soon as they be born. They're estranged uh, uh, from the womb. So, as long as the child is in the womb, they're they're not estranged. They're not sinning. But if they're you know once they come out of the womb, boy, man, they just start being sinful. So, I mean, I don't know. Maybe some of you uh, folks that believe in born in sin, maybe y'all gonna start advocating abortion then. You know, let's kill them before they're born, and so that they're not they're not sinning. You know, we don't have all these sinners born into the world. Well, friends, that's that's how ridiculous your arguments are. Uh, John sixteen twenty one. Uh, John sixteen twenty one. A woman when she is in travail hath sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembereth no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now. Who, who's going to be happy that a child is born in sin? See that? I mean, if we're, we're using these verses in a ridiculous fashion like those that teach born in sin, then that's what we're going to say. Friends, born in sin puts every child that dies in infancy in hell. You can't get to heaven. You can't get to heaven with sin. Right, the wage of sin is death, Romans six twenty three. So how is it that these children are born in sin? They're they're sinners, but yet when they die, they die in infancy. They die in accidents, or you know, for whatever diseases or any kind of mistreatment, whatever. When they die, do they they have to? They can't be in heaven. No sin enters heaven. How are their sins forgiven? They surely can't repent of it. They can't repent of sin, see? They can't confess Christ, and everybody knows you've got to believe in Christ. Faith only? Saved by faith only? A child can't even have faith. So your own doctrine, you know, your own doctrine, you're saying, well, faith only. A child doesn't have faith. So, boy, they're just in, they're in between a rock and a hard place, aren't they? And what are they going to do? See what I'm talking about, friends? This is backwards. This is backwards. God does not, God does not uh, look at children as sinful. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that God made man in his image. Now, where did man get this sinful nature? Man sinned so much that it changed his nature. He's no longer like God. And if that's the case, why did Adam and Eve sin? I mean, they were in the image of God. They were so like God. And yet they sinned. So, uh, where, did they, where did their desire to sin come from? Where did their desire to sin come from? My Bible tells me that all, all the spirits come from God. In Hebrews... Chapter 12, Hebrews 12, verse uh, 9. Notice this, Hebrews 12, verse 9. Furthermore, we have, our, have, we have had our fathers of the flesh which corrected us, and we gave them reverence. Shall we not much rather be in subjection unto the Father of spirits and live? So where does the sinful nature come from? I mean, if, if, we, get, if we get our spirits from God... Does that mean we get God gives us our sinful nature? So much backwardness in these doctrines, these man-made doctrines. And I'm just saying, friends, if you stop and really look and, at what is being taught, what, what's being told to you, it's backwards. It's backwards. Man is not born sinful. Man is born sinless. Just the opposite of what man teaches. And then man comes along and says, well, you don't have to do anything to be saved. You know, faith only, maybe. Some people teach you don't, you don't do anything. You don't know works at all. And faith is a work. Now, that's just the opposite of what, what the Bible says as well. But did you ever notice that sometimes even men made doctrines are backward according to uh, when it comes to what they, what they teach? 
They say you're born in sin, which is backwards from what the Bible teaches. And then they say, well, you you know, saved by faith only. Okay? Saved by faith only. Well, now, so I believe. Now what I do? Well, you need to say a little prayer. Well, wait a minute. Why do I need to say this prayer if I just believe? If I just say I believe in Jesus, why do I have to pray? Are you adding something to your own man-made doctrine? Listen, when a man comes along, man says, well, you have to pray for salvation. You have to pray for salvation. I want you to listen to this. Uh, this is a, uh, uh, Wendell Sparrow. He's a uh, preacher in Eden. He's with the, um, I believe it's the Christian Worship Assembly something, something or another. And this is from several years ago. I've talked to Wendell. As a matter of fact, uh, one of our brethren uh, told me today that he... He just talked to Wendell, and uh, Wendell was asking about me or whatever, so maybe I need to go see him. I don't know. <laughs> but listen to what, listen to what, and this is typical. This is typical of what is being taught as far as salvation goes. Listen to what is being said here. And this is about salvation, sinner's prayer, and he's going to tell people to say the sinner's prayer. Let me try that again. Sorry about that. Have my volume up too loud. Bible-believing church, Jesus coming to my heart. Friends, where's that in the Bible? I mean, that's just backwards of what the Bible says. The Bible does not say, pray and be saved. Now, how is that backward, you might say? Well, listen, here's how it's backward. When the apostle Paul, or Saul of Tarsus, when he was persecuting Christians, and he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, listen to what the Bible says. In Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, we're going to start in verse 10. Uh, the Bible says, He was three days without sight, neither did eat or drink. And there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias. And he said, Behold, I am, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the street which is called Straight, and inquire of the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he prayeth. And he had seen a man in a vision. He had seen a man in a vision that... Um, is coming to put his hands on him that he might receive sight. And then Ananias answered and said, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he had done. Now, Jesus says, here's a man praying. He's been praying for three days. Now, why didn't Ananias say, well, Saul, you need to keep on praying. Oh, you're on the right track. Just keep on praying, saying that little prayer. No. When Ananias got to Saul, he said, Why tarest thou? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Ananias didn't tell him to keep praying. Ananias told him, Look, you prayed enough. It's not doing you any good. Now, why then would someone come along today and tell someone, Keep on praying? That's just backwards from what the Bible says. I mean, it is backwards. Prayer is a privilege for those who are in Christ, who are already saved. Prayer is a privilege that, that, that you get once you have obeyed Christ. You don't get the avenue of prayer. You don't get to approach the, the throne of God, uh, Hebrews 4, 16, when you're outside the body of Christ. So, so prayer is not doing you any good if you're trying to have your sins forgiven. 
If you're trying to enter into a covenant relationship with God, prayer doesn't do you any good. Notice this in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12. 1 Peter 3, verse 12. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, why is it that someone who's doing evil, an alien sinner, they're, that is, they're outside the body of Christ, they're strangers from God, why would should we expect that God's going to hear their fa their prayers when the Bible says His face is against is against me? Uh, face is against them that that uh, that do evil. If you're a sinner, you're doing evil. You're disobeying God. You're doing evil, and yet man comes along and says, "Well, the way to get in touch with God, the way to have those sins forgiven, is to pray to God, even though He won't hear your prayers because you're against God." See how silly it is? I mean, it just doesn't make any kind of sense. Prayer is for those who are in Christ. In 1 John, 1 John um, chapter 1, now this is a verse, 1 John chapter 1 is a verse that many times people use in order to uh, teach someone about how to be saved. But 1 John is written to people who are already Christians. Look at this. Um, 1 John uh, verse, let's we'll start in verse 6. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Friends, that's not talking to, to the alien sinner. That's talking to that's talking to members of the Lord's church. That's talking to brethren. Uh, if we back up to verse 3, John says, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. He says, We all have fellowship one with another. Well, friends, if you already have fellowship with God, you're in a relationship with him. You don't have fellowship with him if you're an alien sinner outside the body of Christ. So when, when John says pray, confess your sins, he's failed and just forgives our sins and cleanses from all unrighteousness, he's talking to people who have already obeyed the gospel. Then he says in chapter 2, verse 1, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. You mean once you're saved you can sin? Yes, friends. You can commit sin. Even after you're saved, I hear people say, well, y'all you you believe in water baptism. Y'all must think that you have to be baptized again. No. You don't understand the nature of baptism. You don't understand the purpose of it. Baptism puts you into Christ where the blood is, and then you, you ask for forgiveness, and the blood continually cleanses you. But you have to be in Christ where the blood is. John said, if any man sin." We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Well, you don't have that advocate if you're outside the body of Christ. John says, He is a propitiation for our sins, but not only for ours only, but also the sins of the world. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. So you have to, you have to continue doing something. But prayer, asking for forgiveness, confessing your faults, and things like that, that's... That's all a, a, a privilege for those who are in the body of Christ. So it's just backward. It's backward to say pray and have your sins forgiven. The Bible says, no, you have your sins forgiven. You are part of the body of Christ. You're added to the body of Christ uh, uh, where salvation is. Let's just look at this. In, in uh, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, Paul said, therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. All right, salvation is in Christ. So it, once you're in Christ, now you have the privilege of prayer. And that's what I'm saying, friends. You're, you're in these man-made churches, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, whatever they are. Your prayer is not being heard. And the reason I know that, friends, because you can't be in Christ by being in a man-made church. That's, that's just backwards. 
for someone to say, well, I'm going to be in a man-made church and it's going to put me in Christ. No. It's not possible. It's not possible. I had a man tell me the other day, I, been, I was, I was uh, listening to what y'all taught about baptism for the mission of sins, so I had my Western preacher tell me, baptize me for the mission of sins. Well, the Western preacher might have said, I'm baptizing you for the mission of sins. But that's not the, the baptism that the Bible talks about. The Bible doesn't talk about being baptized for the mission of sins and then you wind up in a man-made church or you stay in a man-made church. If you obeyed Bible baptism, forgiveness of sin would come not because you were baptized and someone said over you, I'm baptizing you for the mission of sins, but because when you were baptized, God removed your sin and put you into the body of Christ. See that? It's because when you follow the, the, the prescription, and when you follow the orders, the commands, and you do what God says, it, you wind up in a place where God says you'll be. Now, it's one, you know, I can, I can take my car to the mechanic, and he says, oh, James, I, I changed your transmission. I put a, put a brand new motor and transmission in your car. Well, that don't mean that he did. See, you can say it. That don't mean that it happened. And so, when we're talking about praying to have your sins forgiven, the Bible doesn't talk about that. Not for an alien sinner, not for someone who's outside the body of Christ. You don't pray to get into Christ where you're saved. You are saved and then you're in Christ where now you can pray and ask for forgiveness. See, man's just backwards. Man's backwards. He's backwards when it comes to these things because he's not doing what God said. Again, back to Jeremiah. Jeremiah 23. I told him what to do. I'm paraphrasing. Jeremiah 7, 21 through 25. God said I told him what to do and they didn't do it. They went backward, not forward. And that's why they're backwards on all these things. Baptism, they say, is not essential to salvation. Friends, that's backwards. That's backwards. To say that you're saved and then baptized is just backwards from what the Bible says. Listen, friends, in 1 Peter, 1 Peter 3 and verse 21, the Bible says, the like figure whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now friends, the Bible's clear that baptism saves. Baptism saves. Not because there's something special about the water, but because you've obey, obeyed God in doing what he said. God is the one who removes sins, and he does it when you obey him in baptism. Listen, Colossians 2 and verse 11 and 12. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the sins of the flesh, putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein ye are also risen with him through the faith of the operation of God who hath raised him from the dead. It's in baptism where God operates. God operates and removes your sins. So when you obey God, and you have rendered obedience to the gospel, like God said, then God is going to do his part and remove your sins. But to say, well, I was, I was saved and then baptized is to say that you had your sins removed before you had the operation. Now, friends, I don't know about you, but that's, that's some medical technology we need to explore. If you can, have, you can have the procedure done before you ever have the operation, I wish that had happened before I uh, had my appendix taken out many years ago. Boy, that was painful. I sure would like to, for, for me to be able to say to the doctor, well, now, doctor, here's what we're going to do. I want you to remove my appendix before you put me under and do the operation. And then I can go about my merry way and never have to go through the pain of you cutting me. And that's what people say when they say baptism is not essential. They're saying, well, God removed my sins and then I'm going to be baptized. Friends, why do you have the operation if God's already done it? See? Mark 16, 16, he, this, friends, you, you just can't get around this. This is un, unget overable, as one man said. It's unget overable. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Now, friends, you just can't get around that. Where, where is salvation? 
Is it before or after baptism? He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth, one, and is baptized, number two, shall be saved, that's number three. Now, friends, Jesus didn't say he that believeth and is saved shall be baptized. He said he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. You just can't get around that, friends, unless you're trying to do something backwards. But to say that I'm going to be baptized after I was saved, that's why when these people say, well, I'm, I'm going to have a, we got 10 people were saved and we're and next Monday and next Sunday, the Sunday after the first full moon of the of the uh, equinox of the first day of spring or whatever it is, we're going to have a big baptism, baptismal party or whatever. No, friends, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says immediately they were they heard the gospel, they repented their sins, they confessed that Jesus Christ was the Son of Man, Son of God. They then were baptized for their mission of sins. They they didn't wait because their sins would not be forgiven until they were baptized. See, it's just backwards. And friends, I just don't understand why so many people are are content with with going backwards from what God says. I have here in my in my hands this track. Um from uh it's put up by the Baptist Church. It doesn't have a local church uh, name on it. But here it's the title is How to Become a Christian. How to Become a Christian Now. And friends, there's nothing in here about being baptized for the mission of sins when the Bible clearly says that. They said you recognize you're not you're not a Christian. Recognize you're not a Christian. Recognize that uh, you're guilty of sin. Confess that you cannot save yourself. Well, the Bible says save yourself from his untoward generation, Acts 2, verse 40, 41, so apparently you can. So it's just backward from, from what God says. Confess you're hopelessly lost. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says confess Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 8, verses 36 and 37. Philip said, If thou believest all thine heart, thou mayest. And the eunuch said, I believe that Jesus Christ, Son of God. He didn't say confess that you're hopelessly lost. This tract says, Then call on the name of the Lord on bended knees. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, Repent and be baptized over one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, friends, this is not how to become a Christian. This little tract's not how to become a Christian. It's how to be lost. Friends, I, I hope you realize there's so many more, so many more things we can talk about that are just backwards from what the Bible says. I think I've got about two minutes. And um, so I want to, want to tell you how much I appreciate you listening. And, friends, uh, again, there's so many things that you could you could discuss, that you could look at, and I hope that as we're going through this, you're realizing, you know what, there, there's some things I need to double-check. You need to double-check. Because I can assure you, friends, if what you're believing and what you're teaching, what you're being taught is not in the Bible, it's backwards from what God says. You're going backwards. If you'd like to reach me, my phone number is 276-340-2653. When we get off the air, you want to call me? Go ahead, 276-340-2653. A word from the Lord brought to you by the Church of Christ that meets 250 the Boulevard in Eden, uh, North Carolina. We meet Sundays at 9 a.m. for worship, 10 a, uh, 9 a.m. for Bible study, 10 a.m. for worship. And uh, Thursday evenings at 7 p.m. for Bible study. Uh, we never ask you for money, friends. If you visit with us, and let's say it's on the first day of the week, uh, when we pass the plate, we don't expect you to give anything. Don't ask you to give anything. Uh, we just, we're just glad you're there. We're just glad you're there. We're glad to see you. You will become a stranger, but you leave a friend. Some of you are listening. Some of you, you know, I see you on the street or talk to you and you say, I'll you know, listen to the program, watch the program, know who you are but you never visited with us. I just don't know why. So we'd like to see you again, like to visit with you. Please come out and visit with us. Friends, always make sure that what you're getting is a word from the Lord. And until next week, God bless. And uh, I'm about, about ready to wrap up, producer. And uh, God bless. We hope to see